this. So I'd like, I'd like to uh, call Ju Julieta Grisco. Um, while Paul, Paul Ju Julieta's connecting, I, I'd just like to recognize uh, a few people, aside from Neil and Howard Messing. Uh, I'd like Bob Bergino and Mark Kastner, who are my predecessors and both deans, and one's a chancellor, one's uh, Mark's at the Science Philanthropy Alliance, Tom Graytack, former associate head, Janet Conrad, former uh, chair of the Papalardo Committee, and um, Maren Kardar, who I believe was the chair of the first Papalardo Committee that I served on 17 years ago. There's stories from back then. <laughs> okay, so Julieta is going to uh, talk about shedding new light on the nature of matter, and I'll, I'll just say this is a subject close to my heart, so <laughs> Julieta. Hello, I'm Julieta Grusco. I'm a first year Pablo fellow. Uh, thank you, Pablo, for that great uh, introduction uh, to the symposium. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how neutrinos can help us shed new light on the nature of matter uh, and the universe. So particle and nuclear physics and really all of fundamental physics tries to answer some basic questions. And one of the most important is why are we here? Uh, under this category, you can, you can put a bunch of questions. Things like, why is there something and not nothing? Why is our universe filled with matter and not antimatter? Um, things like, why does the universe have the structure that it does? So what is dark matter? Or why do the particles have the masses that they do? Um, and what's really exciting about neutrinos, and specifically neutrinoless double beta decay, which is what I'm gonna talk to you about, is that it can answer a couple of these really important questions. It could tell us why there's something and not nothing in our universe, and it could tell us about these fundamental particle masses. Uh, neutrinos have rescued our understanding of physics before. This isn't the first time that they could play this role. Uh, just from their very invention or discovery, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, um, they, they've been telling us all sorts of things about fundamental physics. So this all started kind of in the early 1900s. There were the first observations of beta decay. So beta decay is when a neutron turns into a proton and emits an electron. And they thought that these were the only particles that were participating in this interaction. And if this is the decay that you look at, um, the energy of this electron that comes out, it should always come out with the same speed because it should just carry away the extra energy uh, from the mass difference between the proton and the neutron. But when they actually started observing this, that wasn't the case. There seemed to be missing energy in the reaction. So instead of having the same energy every time this happened, this electron varied in energy, which is what this curve shows. You had some electrons with more energy out here and some with a lot less energy. Um, so this was a big conundrum to physicists in the 1920s. Uh, they thought, well, maybe we have to throw out energy uh, conservation, momentum conservation, uh, when we get down to these tiny scales. But a brave physicist named Pauli came, across, came along in about 1930 and said, well, I'm gonna do something terrible. I'm going to propose an invisible particle. What if there is this invisible particle that's escaping your detector and carrying off the extra energy? Um, therefore, leaving your electron with some variable amount of energy, depending on how much energy this neutrino carries off. So for that particle to be invisible, it would have to be neutral, weakly interacting. And from the shape of this curve, you could tell that it had very low or no mass at all. Um, so this was this proposed particle, the neutrino. Okay, if you actually wanna confirm that this is happening, you need to detect the neutrino, you need to find it. And to detect the neutrino, we're going to look at the inverse process of that beta decay that I just told you about. You're gonna look for an anti-neutrino now coming in, hitting a proton, and creating a neutron and a positron, the antiparticle version of the electron. If that positron is kind of captured in your detector, it will give off light, uh, which you can measure. All well and good. The problem is that because neutrinos are so weakly interacting, you're going to need a really big source of neutrinos. So people were playing around with this idea, and the people thinking about this problem were working at Los Alamos, so they said, what about we use a nuclear bomb? That'll make a lot of neutrinos. Uh, we can put a detector in really close to a nuclear bomb uh, and watch the neutrinos come out of it. Luckily, they thought about it some more, and they said, okay, on second thought, let's lose the nuclear reactor instead. Uh, what's nice about using a nuclear reactor is that you can make a more complex detector. Now, instead of just looking for this outgoing positron, you can also capture this neutron onto an atom, which emits more light. And if you look for both of these things happening simultaneously, you can reduce your backgrounds. So you've given up some neutrinos by not putting your detector near a nuclear bomb, but you've made a more complex detector that reduces backgrounds. 
And that allowed you to get down to the sensitivities needed to detect the neutrino. People worked on neutrinos for decades, um, and the understanding of the weak force that we had suggested that neutrinos were massless. Uh, Mike will tell you more about that later. Uh, turns out that's not the case, as anyone who's been watching the Nobel Prize Committee's activities has heard. Uh, neutrinos actually have very small non-zero masses. And what do I mean by very small? Uh, I mean that they're about, a, at most, a million times less massive than the next next largest particle in the standard model. So these are kind of outlier particles. They don't behave like anything else we see. That idea that the neutrinos have mass gives you some really interesting implications. So imagine you have two neutrinos cruising along in space. Uh, we have a left-handed neutrino and a right-handed anti-neutrino. So they're moving in the direction of this white arrow. And they have spin, because they're fermions. And in the weak force, you can only make left-handed neutrinos and right-handed anti-neutrinos. So the spin of the neutrino will be anti-aligned with its direction of travel, and the spin of the anti-neutrino will be aligned with its direction of travel. Now, because these neutrinos have mass, they move at less than the speed of light. And that means that Einstein and special relativity tell us that we should be able to move faster than the neutrinos and look at them, and they should behave exactly the same way. So when we do that, we move to a boosted reference frame, and what we see is that now our neutrinos seem to be traveling in the opposite direction, but their spin is still pointed in the same direction as it was before. So now, instead of a left-handed neutrino, we have a right-handed neutrino, and instead of a right-handed anti-neutrino, we have a left-handed anti-neutrino. If you look at this, you say, actually, these two things look exactly like the same particle. I don't know why I've called this one a neutrino and this one an anti-neutrino. They're both neutral. Uh, and they have all the same quantum numbers. They look the same. Um, same thing for these two particles. So you could actually associate these and say they're actually the same particle. That's what it means for the neutrino to be a Majorana particle. It means that a right-handed neutrino and a right-handed anti-neutrino are actually the same thing, and a left-handed anti-neutrino and a left-handed neutrino are the same thing. So why are we interested in this idea? This is kind of a proposed theory of the neutrino. The neutrino could be what's called a Majorana particle. This is interesting to us because of this problem of neutrino mass. That Majorana nature uh, also gives the neutrino a mass, and it does it without requiring you to create any invisible particles that don't interact via the weak force. There is, of course, another option to give the neutrino mass. You could do it the way the other particles get their masses, which is called a Dirac mass. That's from interaction with the Higgs field. Um, the problem with this is that it leads to this kind of unnatural seeming neutrino mass. Why is the neutrino a million times lighter than every particle that gets its mass this way? Uh, what's particularly intriguing to us, though, is actually a combination of these two theories. If you have both kinds of mass terms, you can naturally get out this very small neutrino mass, and all of the new particles that don't interact get stashed away at very high energy scales, where we actually expect new things to be happening. The other nice benefit from this is that it can help you with this matter-antimatter imbalance problem. So let's take a step back and talk about that problem. This is The Mystery of the Missing Antimatter, which is actually a book you can buy, uh, written by a couple of physicists, of course. <laughs> uh, and we have this question of why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? So now, before we had an uh, order of a million disagreement between the neutrino mass and the other particle masses, this is an even bigger disagreement. We see a billion times more matter than antimatter in the universe. And we don't know why, because everything, almost everything we've seen treats matter and antimatter exactly the same way. We don't see enough imbalance in the laws of physics to create this large imbalance. But if the neutrino is Majorana, this left-handed neutrino, when you boost, turns into a right-handed neutrino, which is actually an anti-neutrino. So now there's no conservation of this thing called lepton number, which accounts for the number of particles versus the number of antiparticles. That's not a conservation law that holds in the universe under this case. And it means that you can make more matter than antimatter. Uh, and Majorana neutrinos could give you a way to do that in the early universe. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's worth looking to see whether neutrinos are Majorana. And the next question is, how do we do it? Since I am an experimentalist, this is what I have to worry about. So luckily, nature has given us a two neutrino double beta decay, or a double beta decay. Uh, this is a standard model process, and it's just two beta decays happening simultaneously. So two neutrons turn into two protons plus two electrons plus two antineutrinos. These antineutrinos escape your detector, and you measure the energy from everything else. And like when the neutrino was discovered, that gives you this broad spectrum of energies, right? The neutrinos can carry off a varying amount of energy. If the neutrino is Majorana, though, what could happen is that those two antineutrinos can actually annihilate with each other. And that's what that looks like. In this case, no energy is escaping your detector. 
So all of the energy is measured, and instead you get this sharp peak on the end of this long spectrum. So that's what we're gonna look for. We're look, going to look for this sharp peak right here. The hard part is that this is a very rare decay. Uh, our half-life for the standard model process is actually 10 to the 20 years, which when you think about the fact that the universe is 10 to the 10 years old, that seems kind of impossible. Uh, luckily, Avogadro's number, which tells you kind of how many atoms are in a kilogram of something, basically, is 10 to the 23, so that helps a lot. Uh, so if you want to measure something with a half-life of 10 to the 20 years, you have to get something like 10 to 100 grams of whatever source it is. Uh, and you have to get a pretty low background, 10 to 100 counts over the course of your experiment. So we've actually measured this, and it's the rarest process we've ever measured. Now we're moving on to measuring neutrinoless double beta decay. So the current generation of experiments is at a sensitivity of something like 10 to the 26 years. Um, that's an experiment that's kind of a few tens of kilograms uh, with something like one to 100 counts of background. Most of our field is focused on running those experiments and preparing for this exper these experiments, the next generation, which are going to go another order of magnitude and sensitivity, and go to something like a ton of material, a ton of isotope that has to decay, um, and less than 10 counts of background. But the project I'm going to tell you about and the project I've been focusing on actually goes one step further. How do we cover kind of most of the available parameter space for this process that we want to look in? Um, and to do that, we have to go to something like tens to 100 kilo, uh, tons of material with very low backgrounds. That's kind of our stretch goal, and that's what New Dot is focusing on. So to give you an idea how these experiments work and set you up for the experiment I work on, let's talk about one of the currently operating experiments. This is Kamla and Zen. Uh, it has the best sensitivity of any currently operating experiment. And what it does is it looks for decay is coming from this inner volume, which is doped with a double beta decay isotope, in a, a chemical called a liquid scintillator. So this is a chemical that glows when energy is deposited in it. And this whole sphere is just coated in light detectors that measure the strength of that glow. And the light that we're measuring is this scintillation light, which is isotropic, meaning it goes off equally in every direction from your interaction. Um, and so that's where you get this energy curve and you look for that bump in energy. These experiments are really nice when you're thinking about how to scale up to that next generation and the generation after, because it's a single volume. So it's the kind of thing where you can imagine making something that's 100 tons. Uh, there's a lot of the currently operating techniques that you really can't scale up to that size. So if we want to scale up, we have to do it with something like Kamlan Zen. And the efforts that we're working on here at MIT it's a project called NuDot, and this is a prototype detector that wants to demonstrate directional liquid scintillator uh, detection. So the idea is, uh, if we can demonstrate that this is a valid technique, then when they go to build the next generation or the next to next generation of Campbell and Zen, they can use these techniques in those larger experiments. And the idea behind this is pretty simple. Our signal is this double beta decay, with or without neutrinos. And that leads to two charged particles coming off of a nucleus. One of the backgrounds we're worried about is actually from neutrinos from the sun. This is an unshieldable background because neutrinos can't be blocked uh, because they interact so little. Um, and there's no way to reduce them because you can't turn down the sun. So the neutrinos are gonna get there no matter what. And what they can do is they can hit your nucleus and scatter off of an electron. And the neutrino scatters off and now we get this single charged particle. And these can have a range of energies, these electrons, including the same energy that these two electrons have together. So this is considered an irreducible background. Uh, but you'll notice, maybe it's not actually irreducible. These things look very different. This one has two charged particles. This one just has one charged particle. If you can tell apart two charged particles from one charged particle, you can get rid of this background. How do we do that? Well, we use something called Cherenkov light. Uh, when a particle is moving faster than the speed of light in the medium, it basically develops the same thing that happens in a boat moving through the water. It develops a bow wave of light. Um, and that just leads to a cone of light or a circle of light, depending on kind of how you, where you measure it, um, that is moving in the same direction as your charged particle. So this is no longer isotropic light, this is directional light that tells you where that particle was going. And it's actually what you see when you see kind of nuclear fuel rod storage, this blue light that's coming out. This is Cherenkov light from charged particles in that water. So if we think about what our signal and our background look like, now what we're trying to do is tell apart two cones of light from the two betas from one cone of light, which is our background. 
Um, so you can see here, these are some simulations uh, where the red dots are this Cherenkov light and these light blue dots are the much more abundant isotropic scintillation light. So we need to measure this red light separately from the kind of turquoise signal. Uh, and in the background, we need to measure this bright blue separately from the turquoise. And if we can tell apart these rings, we should be able to tell apart signal from background. So how in the world are we going to disentangle these two signals, the Cherenkov from the scintillation? Well, luckily for us, scintillation processes have inherent time constants. It takes a couple of nanoseconds for the scintillator to get excited. Uh, so that lets us test this in a small scale setup. Uh, something else we can use is the fact that the short wavelength Cherenkov light actually gets absorbed right away and then re-emitted as scintillation light. Whereas the long wavelength light is what actually retains this directional information. So we want to tell about the long wavelength light um, from the shorter wavelength light. And those longer wavelengths actually travel faster in the scintillator medium. So as you scale up your detector, this actually gets easier to do, which is kind of the reverse from everything else we do. Normally things are harder to do at larger scales, uh, but this is something that actually gets a little bit easier to do. Um, and the way we're gonna have to do this is we're gonna have to detect really faint light with really fast timing resolution to tell apart these two signals. So if we look at a simulation of something like a detector like Camlin Zen with kind of reasonable timing on our detectors, uh, or feasible timing with our detectors, we can see this really fast blip, faint blip of Cherenkov light and a much larger, slower scintillation light. And we can get something like 63% separation with kind of reasonable technologies that we can expect to have. So that's the simulation. Now it's time to move to reality. Uh, New Dot is the experiment that's going to show this. Uh, we're using a combination of these large detectors, which give you really good energy information by collecting the scintillation light, with these small, fast timing detectors that give you that Cherenkov signal. Um, so this is a collaboration that's led by Lindley Winslow here at MIT, um, and it's basically a group here at MIT working with uh, people from uh, Boston University, UCLA, and UChicago. First, we're gonna make a prototype of a prototype. So this is what we've been doing for the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, we built this five by five array of these fast timing PMTs to test the PMTs and show that we can do this in a small scale setup first. Um, so over the last kind of nine months that I've been here, or I guess something like nine months that I've been here, um, I've been kind of upgrading this system and starting to get usable data out of it. Uh, we did that with help from everyone from undergrads, grad students, and postdocs. Uh, our, one of our undergrads from the uh, MIT science program last summer uh, helped develop this beta collimated source. So this is now a, a pointable source that you can shoot electrons into scintillator with um, and direct them wherever you want, which is kind of nice uh, because you can do things like this. You can tilt it and now the Cherenkov light and the scintillation light have different hit patterns. So if we can show that we can see hit patterns like this and this, we've shown that we can tell apart these two signals. And now looking at some data and some simulation, you see that when you start making the, sim the simulation pixelated like our detectors are, it doesn't look nearly as nice, uh, but it is starting to look like our data. You can see that the Cherenkov light is much more directed in the direction that we've pointed the source, uh, and the scintillation is much more even across the surface. And the real kicker is the timing information. We can see that we have this really fast blip of Cherenkov light and then this slow bump of scintillation light that dies away. And that means that these fast timing PMTs are performing as well as we need them to to build this experiment. So the other thing I've been working on is actually designing this experiment and getting ready to build it. Um, so this is kind of a mock-up of what that's going to look like. Uh, the whole thing is a sphere of PMTs pointed at scintillator and immersed in a mineral oil tank. Uh, so we're working with engineers from Bates and MIT uh, to start building this this summer. But we can take a step back and say 63% separation I told you we could get between scintillation and Cherenkov light. But that's not 100%. How can we do better? And we're trying a lot of things to do better. Uh, one of the most exciting and the reason that this project is called New Dot is the use of quantum dots. So I'll let uh, condensed matter physicists maybe do a better explanation of this, but basically a quantum dot is like a box for a photon in the photon in a box metaphor. Uh, so it emits at a very specific wavelength. Um, and if we can tune that scintillation wavelength with these quantum dots down to smaller uh, wavelengths, 
we can get later scintillation arrival and improve our timing separation. So we can shift this red curve to the right. And that can get us up to separation of something like 86%. Plus, you get the added benefit that you can make these dots out of the isotopes that you need to use anyways for double beta decay. Uh, so we kind of kill two birds with one stone. So in our lab here, we've already started making our own quantum dots and testing them to see if they have the properties that we need. Uh, so I've been working with one of our graduate students, uh, Diana Gooding, to mix up some dot cocktails and measure how bright they are and whether they emit at the wavelengths that we need. The other place we're pushing on development is the development of new detectors. So I've been working with a company uh, outside of Boston uh, that's been trying to build these large fast timing detectors. So our current detectors have something like 150 picosecond timing, um, and that's part of what sets that 63%. If we can get up to 50 picosecond timing, like these detectors can do, uh, we can further improve that. Plus, we wouldn't have to use two types of detectors. We could actually tile the entire sphere uh, with this sort of detector called an LAPPD. Finally, there's also work uh, going on from our graduate students who are using some of the deep learning techniques that have been developed for computer vision uh, to do better at recognizing these kinds of sparse rings. Um, so this is when you're actually running, how do you tell apart a ring from just some random photons? Um, and we've got a lot of interesting techniques uh, using neural networks that can, that can do that. So NuDot is finalized, we're finalizing the design of NuDot and we're hoping to begin construction this summer. Uh, the goal is to demonstrate at the surface at Bates Lab uh, that we can use a pointable beta calibration source and see Cherenkov rings and scintillation. And we're moving towards doing an underground proof of concept measurement in Italy uh, of the two neutrino double beta decay with the goal of then being an upgrade path for future double beta decay experiments. None of this work would be possible without the support of the entire group here at MIT. Um, they're just a pleasure to work with. And of course, the entire MIT physics department. It's been really nice being able to get to know them at things like Papalardo lunches. And finally, a huge thanks is due to Neil and Jane. Uh, this project that I, I've been showing you is exactly the kind of project that's difficult to get funding for. It's very long range and forward looking. Um, and with the Papalardo Fellowship, I'm able to devote time to a project that I might not otherwise be able to work on. So it's been a really wonderful experience. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julieta. That's terrific. Um, so we have a tradition that, that Neil and Howard, who actually study for the symposium, get to ask the first questions because they've done their homework. So I'll call on Neil or Howard. Well, thank God it's about a, uh, something that we might have a chance of asking a question. Why does it relate directly to this experiment other than the neutrino supposedly could be its own antiparticle? For a particle to be its own antiparticle, it presumably has to be neutral. Yep. Have we found, I know we have found the antiparticle of a neutron. Have we found the antiparticle of any of the other neutral particles? Um, so it needs to, for it to kind of be meaningful for a particle to have an antiparticle, it also needs to be kind of a fundamental, well, it doesn't have to be fundamental, but it has to be a fermion, right? Um, and so you can think of something like, is there an antiphoton? But it's not really meaningful for photons and antiphotons to be a thing. Um, we have found, uh, so in terms of neutral fundamental particles, uh, we don't have any other neutral fundamental fermions. Uh, so the bosons, it's not meaningful for them to have antiparticles uh, because they don't have spin. So there's nothing else to reverse in terms of quantum. So phase. other than the neutron finding its antiparticle, there has been no other. So the neutron's a composite particle. And so if there's other composite particles, we've seen the antiparticles of those. But aren't there other composite particles yeah, that so are neutral? Yeah, so we've have seen. Have they found the antiparticle of each and every one of them? I don't know about all of them. But at some but, of them. Yeah, I mean, you can see the, the antiparticles of composite particles. Okay, so therefore, yeah. it's only the neutrino that we believe could be its own antiparticle. Yeah, it's the only fermion that could have this property of being Majorana, because it's the only neutral fundamental fermion, right? Um, so it's, of the things that could be Majorana, it's the only one. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Want a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, my understanding is that the 
only reason we think they have mass, or we know they have mass, is we infer that because they change with time and special relativity tells us that anything that changes with time has to have mass. But we haven't actually weighed a neutrino. Right. Right? Is there any hope? Uh, uh, I feel kind of funny saying this sitting in front of Ray Weiss, but 50 years ago, people said we'd never be able to measure gravitational waves. Yeah. Um, you're young. <laughs> so I think we'll be able to measure Yeah, is there any, any chance we'll be able to you know, put a beam of neutrinos in front of a lead ball and watch a curve? <laughs> uh, um, that probably won't be how we'll do it, but I do think there's a lot of promise to measuring the neutrino mass. So actually, the next experiment that's seeking to measure the neutrino mass just started up. Um, it's going to have another kind of order of magnitude sensitivity. And we do know that there's a lower limit on the neutrino mass, right? Because if you, just from the oscillation parameters, you can get the spacing. So if you add together all the spacings, it tells you kind of what the minimum mass is. Uh, so at least we have a floor when we start looking. Right. And there's a lot of interesting techniques being developed. Um, and if none of the laboratory-based techniques work, there are also kind of cosmology-based techniques right. that could tell us the neutrino mass as we spend more time uh, kind of refining those measurements. Thanks. So I do think we'll find the neutrino mass. <laughs> okay, other questions? Questions from the audience? Well, I have okay. one more. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was talking to Janet earlier out there. That's her field, neutrinos. And uh, it seemed to me there have been things that I've seen published that indicate the total mass of the neutrinos is perhaps 0.1% of ordinary matter mass. Simultaneously, she stated that we have a handle on neutrino density, how many neutrinos there are per In the universe. cubic yep. something or other. Obviously, those two numbers can be divided yeah. and to give us a handle on what the mass of an individual neutrino is. So I'm not sure I, um, the first thing you said was, oh, the fraction of the energy of the universe that's in neutrinos, right? right? About 0.1%. I've seen that published in a number of papers. Doesn't mean yeah. it's right or wrong, <laughs> but that, total mass divided by the, the neutrino density. density should be able to give us the S mass per neutrino. So, yeah, I'm, I think the, the place you run into issues is that the precision scales that we're working on are very different. So when we're trying to find the mass of a particle, we're looking for something that's kind of a change of one part in a a billion, I think, in the curve of the beta decay spectrum. So when we look for the distortion of this electron spectrum from the neutrino's mass, that's a one, one in a billion change or so. Uh, whereas when you're talking about these cosmology parameters, like the energy density in neutrinos, those are known to much less uh, sensitivity. So the limits of what we can do with cosmology are kind of still fairly far away from what we can do in laboratory-based experiments Thank you. when it comes to things like this. Question from Washington Taylor. That was a great talk. Um, I have sort of two related questions. One is just to make sure I understand, when you say that this experiment, the, the one you're working on at the bottom of that list, ideally is going to probe the full range of parameter space. So is that under the assumption that we have both Majorana and Dirac masses, and this is a seesaw yeah. mechanism going on? Yeah, you don't have to have both of those things, but what you have to have is an effective light Majorana neutrino exchange Good. in the double beta decay, which you can do that with type 1 seesaw. You can do that in some other ways as well. Um, but that kind of sets yeah, the, where this bottom of this curve is of sensitivity. So it's, we consider it kind of a theory island for our experiments. Great. And the second part of the question is, so your assertion is you're, you're hoping to cover the whole range of parameter space. So does that mean that if the experiment does not see neutrinoless double to beta decay, that in a finite time we will have ruled out completely the possibility of a, of a Majorana mass in the usual framework? To, to rule it out completely, you'd also need to have 
um, a good understanding of the neutrino's mass because there is this place where your phases can cancel perfectly, um, but that you can get from knowing the neutrino mass. Are you sitting in that part of the parameter space or not? Um, so in a combination, in an ideal world where you've excluded kind of down to 10 to the 28 year half-life and you've measured the neutrino mass, you could say fairly definitively whether there's a type one seesaw where you have a very heavy part partner that's, that's causing this Cool. Process. And what's the time frame in which you might hope to either rule it out or find it? <laughs> that's, a, that's the big question. Um, the next generation of experiments that want to probe the inverted hierarchy region uh, are going to get started in the next decade or so, uh, or less. And our work is kind of probably on a couple of decade time scale, I would yeah. say, a uh, 20 year time scale, hopefully during my career. <laughs> <laughs> But it really depends, I mean, it depends on a, a lot of things about how well we understand the nuclear physics, which Mike is gonna talk about a little bit, um, and some other inputs, so stay tuned. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks.